So what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so, I hope that I'll try to persuade you some of the reasons why I think that we should be doing computing at school. I'm sure some of you would agree with me anyway, but the kind of messages, and maybe we'll just might discuss some of these afterwards. Um, right, um, although I was born in the 70s, I call myself a child of the 80s. That's me in the 80s. I had lots of hair then. It, it seemed fashionable to have lots of hair in the 80s. Now it doesn't seem quite as fashionable <laughs> as my 80s. Um, moved, to, moved from Ireland to England in 1983. And I remember that first Christmas, I got one of these Sinclair Spectrum. And it was great because it meant I didn't have to go outside and play football or go on my bike. I could just spend hours and hours, sat at one of these, plugged into the TV. And used to get these magazines where you'd copy things out of the magazine, type them all, and it wouldn't work. So, but you'd have to... The next magazine would come out a month later, which would have the error corrections in. So you had to spend a month, basically, trying to figure out why the program didn't work. And then when the magazine came, you'd, you'd already fixed it by the time the next issue came out. And at the same time, in school, this school, at least we got this school, we had these BBC micros. And I remember there was about eight of them in a room. And again, at lunchtime, we'd go in every day, and we could write all these programs. And after a bit, that got a little bit boring. I wanted to try it to another level. so. So I trying to interface things with them, network them together, send messages. It was amazing. We could send messages from one end of the room to the other. And it was like you didn't have to talk to people. <laughs> so um, that's kind of why I'm interested in this particular topic. Now, um, at the moment, people say that the games industry, just selling video games, it's a £2 billion global industry. So there's more money being spent on video games than there are on film or on music. And I think maybe a few years ago it would have been the other way around, maybe music or, you know, people would say, I want to make loads of money so I want to be a singer, I want to be in a band. Now if you want to make lots of money, you need to be in the games industry. Now, not so far away from Preston, you know, we've got uh, Manchester. And Manchester's got quite a strong heritage in terms of uh, well, manufacturing industry, but also computing. I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, this computer here, this is a photograph of it, it's called Baby, because it was so small. And it took up, uh, it would have taken up probably half the, the length of this room here. Um, it's, it's, no, it's recognized as the first stored program computer that was ever built. And the Americans were trying to do something like this at the time, but they couldn't, and the Brits beat them to it. You know? So we need another reason to be proud of Manchester. And I've not even mentioned football. Um, you, at the Museum of Science and Industry, if you were in Manchester, they, they've got a working model of that still there. And in many ways, it's sort of it was a pioneer, and lots of things have followed on from that. Uh, Ferranti built a computer based on this, and, um, and there's a huge realm of computing history all to do with that. But you can go in and you can watch it. Another reason why Manchester is quite famous. Um, Simon, do you know who this man is? <laughs> okay. No, should I be ashamed? No. This, this guy is called Steve Ferber. And he was involved, back in the 80s, he was involved in a team that, that, that designed and created this the BBC B model computer. And there was a, a company called Acorn. And they went on to develop a particular type of chipset which then meant that computing was cheaper and more affordable, it could be used in schools. And Acorn, there's been times where their popularity and interest has, has done this sort of thing. And Acorn, um, now, they, they have gone on to be a chip manufacturer. And it's Acorn Riscos machine, is where ARM comes from. And every one of you, I'm pretty sure, now will have a, one of those processes in your phone because now all the latest mobile devices are using this. So Manchester's got a lot to answer for, really. That's what I'm saying. Now. So back to my argument about computing at school. I've been teaching ICT on and off since about 1994. And predominantly it's always been this sort of stuff, teaching children how to use Word, how to use PowerPoint, how to create a spreadsheet, how to create a database. And then sometimes we'll make a video, or we'll make a radio advert, or, 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 or something like that. But it's, it's nearly always been using applications for things. 
The difference with computing, if, if you haven't really grasped this, and I would imagine if you work in a university or a college and you're teaching, you probably have grasped this. But it's more about the, the fundamentals, that's, that's what goes on underneath, what goes on inside the box, and when you're using these sorts of things, what goes on in there. So computing, some argue it's a science, it's all about the understanding, the application, the creation of these sorts of things. So computing sits within the ICT thing. Okay. Now, I, I do feel a bit embarrassed because there's people, you know, there's a chap here who lectures in computing at university, and, and I hope I'm getting it all right. But the distinction I'm trying to make is that ICT shouldn't be confused with computing. They're two different areas. Now, computing is predominantly, I would say, it's a problem-solving type of activity. Often there's all these sorts of questions, who, why, where, what, how, when, and you're trying to desi design and create something that might meet a need. If computing is taking place in school, these are some of the contexts that we'd be looking at, some of the areas, languages, machines, computation, data, coordination, abstraction, a huge field there, trying to look at something and then try and create a model of that. You know, um, one project I've tried with a class is where we look at something like a butterfly and you want the butterfly to fly from one side of the screen to the other. And the first thing we do is we just have a butterfly that moves, but it doesn't actually look like the butterfly. So then you have to try and think about how can you make it look like its wings are appearing to move? So there's huge areas there for exploration in school. Um, why computing is not happening in school at the moment? I think because a lot of teachers fear computing. Because when I was at school and I was using computers and BBCs and Sinclair Spectrums, there wasn't really anything in the curriculum that sort of would support that. And what happened was I ended up going into a different field after that. But I think really we need to have opportunities for children to create programs, get to find out what's inside a computer and what makes it work, and then carry on. You know, if they've got an interest in that, develop that interest from an early age rather than wait till they go to college or go to university. And I think teachers quite rightly will be frightened about moving into something like this because it, it is a new area. Um, they might think there's not a lot of resources, you're sort of on your own, you know, so there's lots of reasons why teachers might not want to embrace computing. Now, there's an organisation which recently I've joined called Computing at School. There's lots of generous funding from the British Chartered Institute for IT, Microsoft and Google, and some other organisations as well, and they all have a vested interest. Um, last year, in terms of, um, how would you, I've forgotten how you describe it, but in terms of income generation, uh, the UK was ranked sixth globally in terms of IT and computing. The, the UK was ranked sixth. There's evidence to show that it's dropping in global rankings in terms of how much investment is going into these and how much money has been spent on them. And really, we need to try and overturn that. Now, it could be 10, 15, 20 years before <coughs> that happens, but that's why companies like Microsoft and Google are keen to support this. They have a website. Uh, if you're able to see that from where you are, it says Preston Pub Meeting there on the 30th of June. Um, but there are lots of activities happening around. Uh, there's an annual conference, and they have these newsletters that they produce um, every term or so. And I've brought some copies that you, if you want to take some with you tonight. Now, if teachers are frightened about teaching computing, well, there are a huge amount of resources, and almost every day I'm finding out about some new thing. Yeah. Hello. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Did you know the person that came in bring your list? It's okay. Um, we're looking for a list. Yeah, somebody, somebody will have brought a list in. Okay, thank you. Um, Scratch. This fantastic resource here, it's a, a visual program environment. Children can build quite some high-level complex games within that. Um, some of the old retro games like Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And there's, there's Boston, Massachusetts, there's a university there called MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And every month they're organizing things online and there where you can um, download materials, share materials, they have Scratch Day. Um, there's the University of Kent, I hope I'm saying this right, has developed another visual program environment called Greenfoot. And there's a summer school doing the summer and they were there showing people how to 
develop and create learning resources using Greenfoot. Um, Microsoft have recently been publicizing Kodu, which you can create code, you can download this on your PC, create games yourself on your PC, and you can then download them to your Xbox. And it will integrate with the Xbox Connect as well. Um, there's a feature within Jar the Greenfoot application to connect as well for connect. So you can um, you can create a game in Greenfoot and you can do all this sort of stuff you know to, to play the game. Um, and this is one I've just heard about recently. But if I start to put them all down there wouldn't be enough space on this. So there are loads of resources. This is an exciting development. Anybody here heard of Raspberry Pi? Yep, okay, it's a few hands going up in the room. Um, not much bigger than a 20 pence piece, around the size of a USB stick. It's expected to cost around about £15. It's going to have a USB port on one end, which you can plug a keyboard and a mouse into. A HDMI port here, which will plug into a, a TV or a monitor. And you've basically got a computer there that you would carry around with you. It can keep the cost down because it hasn't got a keyboard, it hasn't got its own power supply, on, it hasn't got batteries and a screen, but it will work just like a PC. You can run Linux on it, you can, you can do development, programming, um, for not very much money. And, um, and this is my last bit. There's, um, there is a, a large group of people at the moment that's growing that believe that we should now be introducing computing in schools and um, that's, that's all I've got to say, really. Okay, thank you. <laughs>